is your name? Larry Ulrich. I work for the city of Prairie Grove and I've been with the city of Prairie Grove for 38 years. Uh, what is your date of birth? 8-20-1958. And this interview is for the Prairie Grove Oral History Project and we just want to be sure we have your permission to use the interview. You absolutely do. And uh, where were you born? I was born in Adel, Iowa, just outside of Des Moines. And tell me how you ended up in Prairie Grove. Yeah, when I was 18 years old, I moved to Arkansas and lived in the Fort Smith area. Went to school there, went to junior college for a couple of years, and transferred to the University of Arkansas. And it was after my first year at the University of Arkansas, I took a summer job working for the city of Prairie Grove. Uh, never intended on staying, but uh, the mayor at that time was J.G. Ward. And with about a week before school started, I told him, everybody, thank you for the employment that summer. And J.G. said, well, wouldn't you like to keep working here? And I said, no, I'm going back to school. Well, he came back with a very attractive uh, monetary offer, big raise, and said, you set your own schedule any hours you want. He said, you get 40 hours in, we don't care how you do it or when you do it. And for a college kid, that was, you can't get a better deal than that, be able to set your own schedule. So I continued to go to university and started working here full time and still never intended to make it a career. But uh, here I am 30 or eight years later and I'm still here. Uh, what are your earliest memories of Prairie Grove? Prairie Grove was not anywhere near the size city, of course, it was when I started here. Uh, square miles were about one and a half square miles, where we have eight square miles now. Population was about 1,700, and population today is about 6,000. So, uh, you know, growth is the biggest thing we can say. The city limits, uh, where the post office is now, was pretty much the city limits at that time, and there wasn't much on Buchanan Street or Highway 62 past where the post office is at. So we've seen subdivisions go in, many subdivisions. Uh, we've seen thousands of houses go in since I started working here, lots of new business. It's just, it's, it's a different city than it was in 1979. Uh, tell me about the businesses in the downtown area when you first came here. When I first came here, there was probably seven or eight gas stations within a two block area, in downtown Prairie Grove. And there was at least three cafes in the downtown. Of course, we don't have but one cafe downtown now, and you won't find any mom and pop gas stations left in Prairie Grove. Maybe that's unfortunate, but uh, uh, it's changed. People are much more inclined to drive to Fayetteville for services. So where we had uh, clothing stores downtown, uh, several of them, you know, now we're, we have one. Uh, people just tend to travel more now, so people have had to kind of adapt uh, their business schemes downtown. We're seeing the antique district now, and we're seeing the uh, flea markets, and that's become a big niche for us. So it's just changed. Uh, people tend to drive farther now for services. Let's talk about when you first started working in the city and what the city was like, and then how it's changed over time. Well, we offer a lot more services now. When I came to work here, we had 800 water customers. Now we have 2,500. Um, I think we had maybe two employees, now we have close to, and this is just in the public works, now we have about 20. So uh, as services have grown, the city has grown, our facilities have grown. Um, uh, we offer a lot more services than we did back then. We had one downtown park when I started working here, which was Mott Park, and it was an overgrown park. It had uh, one swing set and one merry-go-round, and that was pretty much it. Now we have four parks that we maintain. The aquatic park has been built. Um, we've expanded the fire department. All of our services have grown. Let's talk about the swimming pool and the history and the, that for years people had wanted that and then you went to the voters and asked for uh, taxes. Kind of tell me about that. Yeah, there was actually, historically, there was actually a couple different times that the city considered building a swimming pool. One was in the late 60s uh, the city had gotten some money from a donor and we're trying to decide how to use it and they had a spot that's actually in the battlefield park now because at that time the battlefield park did not was not a state park it was still locally controlled and there was a location in the park they were going to build a swimming pool well after much debate they decided the swimming pool was not what they needed to do and they built the Heinemann Museum instead at that location so the museum very easily could have been a swimming pool with just you know one change of that decision 
Uh, years later, probably the early 80s, they considered building a swimming pool on Viney Grove Road where the elementary school is now. So there's a couple different attempts to build swimming pools through the year. But it wasn't until we bought the property where Reef Park is now in 1998 that things really got serious. And uh, I would say public is what determined you know, the need to build the pool. We had a number of public hearings and overwhelmingly the number one thing everybody wanted was a swimming pool. And we looked at swimming pools throughout Northwest Arkansas. This was kind of before aquatic parks were the, the norm, which they are now. But Siloam Springs really had the only aquatic park in the area. So we went up and looked at theirs and kind of patterned ours off of Siloam Springs. But uh, we're in our 17th season now, so it's been very successful. Tell how that you set up a permanent tax that would allow you to fund any shortfalls or maintenance of the building and the other facilities. We've had a number of sales tax bond issues through the years, and I think this was the second one that we, we did. After the first ones paid off and retired, we immediately went back to the voters and asked if they would support uh, sales tax for the park. And uh, one thing that we did when we were looking at that, we had concerns over what the cost of operation of the pool would be. So we made sure that we put to the voters that a portion of that tax, one quarter of 1%, would go towards park maintenance. And the libraries kind of got involved in that. They felt left out and some folks that were fairly influential in the library wanted the libraries to be part of that as well. So we included the library in with the park operations and have a permanent one quarter percent tax now that funds library and park services. Uh, one thing that's really been big in Prairie Grove is that they've had a very good uh, emergency services and fire department. Can you kind of talk about how that started maybe on the shoestring and has grown into what it is today? Yes, and Prairie Grove has had a fire department since the turn of the century. Uh, of course, you know, back in those days they used uh, different types of chemicals to put out fires. They didn't have a water source until the 30s, so anything they did prior to that was uh, people hauling water and using chemicals to put out fires. But the fire department has developed through the years and in the mid-70s they built the current fire station, or at least the first version of it. It's been added on two cents. But the fire department has been funded locally. Um, it, uh, it was grown through volunteers and now it's part-time. It's We have part-time and full-time employees so it's grown into a, a regular fire department where we have full-time staff now. Uh, what about the emergency services? Isn't that based there at the fire department? It How is. Does that work? Uh, Central EMS, uh, they have been really the only provider that we've had for about the last 20 years. There was a rural EMS service years ago, but Central has kind of taken that over. And Central is a quasi-governmental run organization. It's run by a board that uh, is represented by all the cities. Uh, Mayor Hudson has actually chaired that board for a number of years. I think he's still on the board, not as chair, but uh, we are represented on that board's executive committee. Uh, let's talk about when you first became, moved from an employee to a manager at the water uh, department and then at some point I think you realized that you needed to raise rates. Let's talk about kind of fear that process. Well, like I said earlier, I started when I was 20 years old. I turned 21 after I'd been here for about a month. So I was, I was pretty young. Um, worked in the water department for about four and a half years. And for some reason, the mayor at that time was Minor Wallace, and he had just recently replaced J.G. Ward. Uh, a couple aldermen that were also involved in that decision was Murph Pear and James Kaiser. And they approached a young, dumb 24 four 25 year old kid and said wouldn't you like to manage public works uh, uh, probably I was too young and too dumb to say no and I said yeah I'll give it a shot so at the age of 24 25 I was offered the public works and administrative uh, administrative position helping the mayor and basically managing the city on a day-to-day -day basis um, one thing we noticed right away is that the water department had a lot of issues uh, their finances were in order, but there had been a reluctance to raise rates through the years. And uh, with infrastructure that dated back to the early 30s, there was lots of needs. Um, pipes don't last forever. Uh, fire hydrants don't last forever. The first thing that really brought this to a head is the fire department had a number of fire hydrants around town that wouldn't work. 
and they came to the council and they said, you know, we've got to do something. This is an emergency. We can't have a fire and not be able to access a fire hydrant. So I pointed out to the council that rates had not been raised in a long time and we couldn't afford to make mass improvements on the system if we didn't have additional income. Um, that first rate increase we did was a little bit of a shock. Uh, by today's terms, it would be very minimal, but at the time it was about a 14-15% increase, so it shocked a lot of people. Since then, we've always done biannual reviews, and if we raise rates, it's by one or two percent, and nobody really notices, but uh, we do it every two years now. Let's talk about the city's decision to join the Two-Ton Water Association, even at a time whenever you had adequate capacity. We did, and it was you know a lot of decision-making because we felt like there were some options that were ignored. Um, there was a debate at the time whether they should hook on to Beaver Water District or if they should create their own. And uh, the create their own kind of got a head of steam up. And we weren't always in agreement with the decisions that were being made, but we felt like we had to join because long term, this was going to be the future. And we knew that, even though at the time we did not have any capacity issues. We had our own water treatment plant. It was adequate for our needs and we had just actually increased the capacity of the plant. But we knew long term, 15, 20 years down the road, uh, this was too important of a project not to participate in. So we actually bought in at a fairly cheap rate. We agreed to purchase 6, 000, or 6, 000 gallons a month, uh, which was about a third of our, our usage at that time. And that's how we got started in two ton. Now two ton actually accounts for about 65% of our water use compared to the 40% uh, that we produce in house. Uh, most cities have gotten away from pr producing their water and hasn't Prairie Grove recently expanded its plant? Let's talk about that. We're actually rehabbing our, our 1976 plant right now and we're going through it uh, piece by piece and actually turning an old plant into a new plant. Um, the decision to do that was based on redundancy. It, it's always a good thing to have two sources. Uh, we don't want to rely on one source. Um, if an emergency happens, we've got a backup. If a major fire occurs, we can produce twice as much water as we could with just one source. So there's a lot of good reasons for keeping the plant. And we are spending about $2 million to rehab it right now. Uh, but we think, again, long term, this is another 15, 20 years that we can rely on this rehab. Uh, we think it's a good choice. Uh, a lot of cities have struggled to meet uh, sewer uh, demand or known as wastewater right and you guys are, have really been in a good position let's talk about kind of how that that came about well our first uh, regulations always dictate what we do EPA is constantly changing regulations and what we're required to meet and back in 1988 we were first notified that we'd have to make improvements and we did a complete rehab on the existing plant then the existing plant was built in 1970 um, that got us in compliance for a while, but then new phosphorus regulations came out thanks to the troubles that we've had with Oklahoma and the Illinois River. And the old plant just, it wasn't built to remove phosphorus, so we decided we had to build a new plant. Uh, we did a, co a couple of things. We went to the tax, the voters again, and we got them to reestablish a 1% sales tax that was going off the books. It was getting ready to go off. We thought this is the ideal moment to get them to uh, both that back in, they did, and that has paid for a good portion of the construction cost, which was right at $9 million. Uh, didn't pay for all of it, but timing is everything again. This was when uh, the country was having a, a big downturn in the economy, and the stimulus uh, packages that came out hit right at the right time. We were able to be the first uh, utility in Arkansas to capitalize from using uh, stimulus money, which was ERA, American Recovery and Resource Act. So we were able to get ERA money, uh, first one in Arkansas to get it, first one to use it, and we got $2 million from ERA, which went towards that treatment plan as well. The rest of the money we did with the uh, rate increase, but uh, that really significantly decreased the amount of rates that we had to increase. One of the big changes in Prairie Grove over the years has been the expansion of the Battlefield Park. And I wanted to back up to, there was a meeting, I think it was in the early 90s, maybe 92, when the highway department said, hey, we're gonna put in a bypass. 
and that kind of spurred that expansion. Can you give me your recollection of that history? Yeah, the first the first meeting about the bypass might have even been late eighties. I don't remember. It might have been nineteen ninety, but it was in around that that time. And uh, Highway 62, of course, runs right through the business district in downtown. That's always been an issue. There's always been a fear that if there was a truck accident in downtown Prairie Grove, it could take the whole downtown out if there was a fire similar to what happened in Van Buren. Um, so from the city's standpoint, getting the trucks off of 62 downtown was the issue. Uh, not necessarily the traffic, which was increasing every year, but getting those trucks out of downtown Prairie Grove. City supported it. Uh, the city caught some flack from people for supporting it because there was a lot of people that thought it would kill Prairie Grove, kill the downtown, and still is today. Uh, but the highway department was pretty much massacred at that original public hearing. Uh, they left here shaking their heads and saying, we're not gonna be back for a while. And they didn't. Uh, but they did revisit it in the early 2000s, probably about 10, 11 years later, they revisited it. Second public hearing was much more favorable. There was probably more people in favor than were against because the people that had worked downtown had seen what the truck traffic was doing downtown. It was actually making people afraid to cross the streets and afraid to use the downtown businesses because the traffic was so bad. So there was some support that was generated. Uh, still lots of beginners, but uh, there was probably more people in favor at that point. Uh, the highway hit it's, it's the highway department, it takes years. So even though they made the decision in the early 2000s, it was 10 years later before we actually realized a new highway to be built. Uh, let's talk about the expansion of the park because there was concerns that the route might go north and then the park kind of decided we need to expand. And I know when you first got here, the park was very small. The park was very small, I think around 40 acres and now it's uh, probably 600 plus acres. So most of that expansion has taken place since I've been here. Um, the park, uh, I think it was actually spurred by the uh, Battlefield Protection Act, which was a federal act, and it identified Prairie Grove as one of the five most vulnerable battle sites in the United States, and one that needed to be protected. So that, that alone generated some cash for the park where they could go out and start acquiring property. It was not a very popular idea at all at the beginning either because lots of farmers were concerned they were going to take their land. Lots of farmers were concerned they were going to restrict the way they could use their land. And there was a public hearing uh, for the battlefield master plan uh, with this expansion that a lot of uh, farmers in the area attended and a lot of farmers spoke out against. But the park gradually started picking up pieces of property. They actually started working with these property owners where they would actually pay them a fair amount for their land. And a lot of the farmers were able to purchase new tracks to replace the land that they sold to the park. And I think the attitude has changed again. Uh, they've protected that whole north corridor now. They were very influential in making the highway go south instead of north. Uh, basically, it wasn't going to happen going through the park. Uh, they've had other impact on the city over the years. We needed to build a huge transmission line, our collection line for our sewer system, and it needed to go north. Uh, they resisted us for several years because they didn't want that sewer line going through the park. That wasn't the biggest issue for them. The issue was the growth that might occur along that sewer line, and they didn't want the growth. But eventually we signed agreements where we wouldn't allow connections in certain portions of the line and they agreed to let us put the sewer line. And there's a funny story that goes with that. Uh, the park uh, came to us about two years after the agreement was signed and said, we're ready to connect to the new line. And I said, you can't. You made us sign an agreement that restricted any connections on that section for five years. So they actually had to wait an additional three years before we could let them connect because of the agreement that they made us sign. Uh, if someone asks you, tell me about your little town of Prairie Grove. Prairie Grove is the best town in northwest Arkansas, if not Arkansas. We, anybody that lives here knows that. Um, we feel like it's got a lot of factors that do that. We have a very progressive, always have had progressive people that live here, the, the Parks family. Uh, you couldn't have asked for better citizens as far as the things they've done for the city. Uh, the reefs, uh, you know, you can just go down through the list of the people that have been there for many, many years and the impact that they've had on us. Uh, the Parks family gave us the tennis court property, then they have paid to build the tennis court, they've paid to maintain the tennis courts, they've paid people to mow right-of-ways, uh, the list goes on and on. The reef family uh, gave us a large amount of money to help uh, build Reef Park when we built it in the early 2000s, early 
late 90s, 2000s. So we've got great people. We have amenities that a lot of towns our size don't have. Uh, I get calls, got a call this week from somebody in Farmington that said, you know, we really wish we had the aquatic park and something like that for Farmington. And uh, I think a lot of people envy the, the improvements that we've made over the years. Did someone ask you, said, Larry, are you going to stay in Prairie Grove for your whole career? Whenever you first took that job, would you have ever dreamed it? No. In fact, there was no intention of staying in Prairie Grove. I had bigger ideas in my head, but I uh, got married. I needed income and continued to work here for probably a year longer than I thought I would, and then another year, and then they promoted me, and now uh, here he is, 30 or 8 years later, and I've been managing the system and managing utilities and uh, basically the city manager now for the last 34 years. Well, you've also taken leadership roles in all the boards that you've been involved in, the regional boards like the two-time Benton County uh, Water Association and the regional planning. Talk about that. How did you get involved in those and how are you? How did you go from the guy in Prairie Grove to kind of a regional? Guy? Well, I've always thought you need to participate. Um, there's so many different organizations out there, so many regional movements out there that need leadership and somebody has to step up. Uh, Tuton, I was the chairman of the board for Tuton for 10 years. Um, the regional solid waste, I've been chairman, vice chairman, executive committee for many, many years. I think I'm the longest serving person on both of those boards uh, now. Uh, on a state level, I've been the all the way to the chairman on the state joint uh, Arkansas Water and Water Environment Association, which is the joint association that joins all of our water utilities and wastewater utilities together. I've progressed through the state ranks on that until I was chairman. And I'm currently the president of the Arkansas Water Environment Association, which represents all the wastewater utilities in the state. Uh, let's talk about the fight with Oklahoma, the water fight, and how Prairie Grove kind of unwittingly got right in the middle of that and uh, how that all went down. Well, of course, uh, you know, justified or unjustified, there was water issues with the Illinois River in Oklahoma. Uh, some of those were where they've shot themselves in the foot with their own practices on their side of the state line. But realistically, there was things that Arkansas could do better. And anybody who discharged wastewater into the Illinois River, even though we may not have been the biggest impact on the river, we were the ones they could point to because we were point sources, which means you can draw a line and say, we know this water is coming from here. Uh, unlike agriculture, which is a lot harder to quantify and identify, uh, wastewater plants were where they pointed to first because they could identify it's coming from you. So Prairie Grove, Fayetteville, Springdale, all of us got heavily involved in uh, water quality in the Illinois River and we've all made huge improvements. Uh, phosphorus of course is the big issue because that's what grows your algae, that's what causes the problems with degradation in the river and our phosphorus levels now run 0.1 milligram per liter to 0.3 milligram per liter where they used to run eight and nine milligrams per liter. So we've reduced those by 99%. Um, let's talk about the different mayors you work for and just kind of tell me more, a little bit about their personalities and what it was like working with them and some of the memories you can think of. Yeah, well, they've all been different. <laughs> and. Uh, to date, I'm really for somebody who's worked here for 38 years, I've only worked for five different mayors, which is pretty remarkable. And first mayor I worked for was J.G. Ward. Um, J.G. had a unique personality, no question about that. Uh, but he also did an awful young, lot for a young man. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him because he's the one that offered me uh, a significant pay increase as well as be allowing me to set my own hours and I probably wouldn't have stayed on if it hadn't been for that offer. So JG was with me for about two or three years and he was he was very much all about JG. But following JG for a brief time we had Minor Wallace. Uh, JG actually had to resign from the council because he took a job in Colorado and wouldn't was not making enough council meetings to really serve as mayor so they asked him to step down. Uh, Minor Wallace was on the council at that time and they appointed Meyer, Minor to take his place. So Minor was mayor for about two years and Minor is the one that came to me and asked me if I would take the promotion into the administrator ranks. So I owe Minor a lot. Minor passed away a few years ago after working for the city of Fayetteville for about 20 years. Um, 
Miner was a hands-off mayor. He let me, as long as I accomplished the task he wanted accomplished, uh, he didn't uh, interfere at all. And then there was Eileen Manning. I uh, had worked with her for two terms. She was the city's first female mayor. Uh, her husband had been mayor previous to that. She was a local nurse and was still practicing nursing most of the time she was mayor. I think she retired from nursing shortly before her last term was up. But uh, she was definitely a hands-on mayor. Uh, she liked to get involved uh, on a daily basis sometimes and liked to dictate the direction the city would take maybe a little more than I preferred at the time. But uh, she made it clear what she wanted done and when she wanted it done. There's no question about that. Uh, didn't always agree, but uh, she was mayor for about eight years. After that, Andrew Bain took her place. Andrew's a local dentist, still a local dentist. Uh, fantastic mayor. Again, he was another one that uh, as long as he had employees that were accomplishing what needed to be accomplished, he stayed out of the way. He helped when he was asked and he stepped in many times that I asked him to step in and did a fantastic job. And then we have, of course, Sonny Hudson, who's been mayor since 2001. He is now the longest serving mayor the city's ever had by a couple of years now. And uh, again, he's he's been He's very involved now that he's retired as far as being here on a daily basis, um, but doesn't interfere with uh, his employees whatsoever unless you know there's a need to. So he's been a very good mayor to work with and we've had a very good tight relationship for many years. Uh, he was city councilman for 12 years before that. So he's, his length of time with the city is you know second only to mine as far as city employees and city officials go. Uh, what other stories do you have that you could tell about Prairie Grove that maybe I haven't thought to ask about? Well, I don't know if anybody's talked about the water tower, but of course that is the biggest story that probably in my tenure. Uh, was, uh, it was a Sunday morning that the water tower was, it was small capacity water tower, but it was an elevated tower. So it was, uh, uh, I'd say 100, 120 feet tall. Uh, located in the alley behind the businesses on downtown. Um, because it was small capacity, the city decided we had built new towers or new tanks south of town and we decided that the capacity that the water that it held wasn't worth the expense of maintaining the tank. Uh, so they decided to take it down and they hired a contractor from Ohio that had tons of experience. That's all he did was take down water tanks all over the country. And he was fortunately well insured and fortunately well bonded because when he took the water tower down, they actually hooked a wrecker to it. They cut the legs out on one side and hinged the front legs so that it would just teeter like a hinge and fall in a straight line. Uh, the wrecker they used originally was not big enough and it teetered it a couple times without being able to pull it over. When they got the bigger wrecker hooked onto it, it had already weakened one of the legs and when they pulled it twisted and sent the water tower right across Crescent, Sterling Drug, and at least one or two other downtown businesses. Uh, we made national news that night. We were on NBC News, Nightly News, and several others, and uh, it didn't destroy any of the buildings. It's a testament to the construction of those buildings because not one of them collapsed. Uh, did cause power outages all over town. It ripped power lines down. Uh, the windows of the stores blew out on both sides of the street just from the impact. Uh, it actually blew glass from one side of the street and knocked windows out on the opposite side. And keep in mind we had probably 500 people downtown to watch this. A lot of them were on the main street where this blowing glass and falling electric lines occurred. So we had people scattering in all directions and it was kind of a scary time trying to keep order because everybody was trying to get out of the way of falling power lines and broken glass and uh, we only had so many people to manage all this, but uh, we maintained and nobody got hurt. And about a week later, the cranes came in, the cranes were able to lift it off, and eventually all the stores were were repaired, but it was quite a story. Was there any water in the No, it, it had been drained, and so it was empty when it fell. But uh, still a huge structure to land on top of downtown businesses. Uh, tell me about the old logger who was downtown. I think it was Mr. Easter that had warned them that it was going to fall. Do you remember that? I've heard the story, but uh, I think that was another case where uh, I, I, I told you so. 
but uh, I think he landed his tree, or he watched the tree that he'd warned that they were going to drop on the street or on the building. They, I think it ended up falling on the buildings like he predicted it would. Uh, were you ever tempted to take jobs in other cities? Have you been approached by, hey, Larry, we would love for you to come to work for a bigger city. We can pay you more. I've actually had a couple job offers over the years. One was to manage the two-ton system when it was built. When they first hired a manager, they offered it to me first, and I turned it down. Uh, mainly because my family was here, my kids were here, they went to school here, and it would have meant relocating. And I wasn't willing to do it. I love Prairie Grove, and I wanted to stay here but I wasn't gonna drive the 50 minutes to an hour a day to go to work, so I turned that job down. Uh, have also been offered jobs by a few other cities in Arkansas over the years, but still here. Um, if somebody had to say, tell me one story that tells a lot about Prairie Grove and what kind of a town it's like, what, what's a story you might think of to tell them? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think of some of the city council meetings over the years where projects, we talked about projects, and then there were projects that we didn't have any clue how we were going to accomplish. And it never has failed that either the voters have backed us up or an individual has come in when there was a need and taken care of that need. It always happens. Uh, I have been involved in at least seven or eight bond issues now. And these are all bond issues that are gonna cost taxpayers money either through a sales tax or increased rates. But we've done at least seven or eight bond issues over the years. And every one of them has overwhelmingly passed. And that's remarkable in this day and time that a tax increase gets passed by an overwhelming margin every single time. But we've laid a case for the need and the people of Prairie Grove have always supported us.